to another installment of the 2021 Online Student Development Conference. With me today are my fellow members of council, Kelita Shadrach, she is our secretary, Shireen Debrain, who is our social media representative, and Ntumi Maringa, who is currently a shadow member of council. Hopefully she's going to stay on if she likes what she's seeing at the moment. And then, of course, not forgetting myself, I'm Mariette Harkham. I'm the chair of the Southern African Archaeological Student Council. And a very special welcome to Pamela Okuku, who is going to be our guest presenter for today. But I'm not going to steal Umpumi's thunder because it's her responsibility to introduce Pamela today uh, as your host. So over to you, Umpumi. Thank you, Mariette. OK, so today's host, her name is Pamela Okuku. She is an archaeozoologist who studies large mammal fauna with a focus on taphonomy. She obtained her BA in anthropology from the University of Nairobi in Kenya. She obtained her master of science in archaeology from the University of Wit uh, Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. And currently she is pursuing her PhD in Tarragona, Spain. And she is based at the University of Rovera Il Virgili, I'm oh, sorry for pronunciation. <laughs> and she's affiliated with the Institute Catalea de Pal uh, okay. It's paleoecological, right? Human evolution and social and society. She she has previously worked in sites such as Kubifora in Kenya and Gondolin and Classy River in South Africa. Her title today on the presentation that she's doing is Iwas to the World. The talk will focus on the importance of study, uh, the importance of studying fauna in a bit to understand human behavior, as well as their social and economic capacities. The talk will cover a new site, namely Iwas Oldupai, which is found in the Western Gorge in Olduvai. This site is important because it has produced currently the oldest stone tools from Olduvai Gorge and has previously never been studied. The Olduvai Gorge Stone Tools Diet and Sociality OGSDS project comprises of various people with, a di with diverse specialties and her talk aims to show the importance of fauna analysis uh, as a proxy for hominin evolution and study. All right, thank you. Uh, Pam, you may start your presentation. Okay. Hi, um, Pamela. Uh, thank you guys for such an amazing introduction. Who maybe forgive you for you know messing up the institution? It's okay. <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing at Ewas Oldupa. I'll try my best to keep within the time limit, and then if you have any questions, you're more than welcome. So without any further ado, let's go. Come on. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So Ewas Olupa, Ewas is the Maasai name or the Ma name for the site that we are currently studying. It means on the way to the gorge. Um, it is a new site. It's never been studied before. Um, the first uh, group to study it is the OG SDS, which is the project that I am part of. And it's very interesting. So let's see. This um, It's a multi-institutional project. And these are all the people involved in the project. So from Tanzania to Australia to Canada to Spain and the Max Planck as well. Um, the study that we had, as Mpumi mentioned earlier, that we produced uh, currently the oldest stone tools in um, Olduvai Gorge, and that led to the publication of this paper in Nature Communications. I have shared the paper, so with the students, if they're interested to learn more about it, you're more than welcome and you'll find all the information. Mpumi will also give you my email address, and if anyone has any comments, questions, or anything you want to ask, feel free to contact me. Um, I'll not talk about this because Mpumi really did a good job of introducing me, so you already know everything there is to know about me, so we're just going to get straight into the presentation. Um, 
this is a view of old Dubai God. So whenever you hear God, old Dubai God, this is the view that comes anywhere. If you Google it, this is what comes up. And it's a really good image because it shows you the various beds in old Dubai God from beds one to five. Um, Ewas Oldupa is on the Western Gorge of Old Dubai, and um, a few sites have been studied in the Western Gorge, but most studies have focused on the main gorge itself and the Eastern side. So we thought if we explore the Western Gorge, we'd be able to, to paint a proper picture of the Old Dubai Basin in, 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 in its entirety. So in 2019, the project that I am part of got permission from the Tanzanian government to prospect all the sites from where you see the red circle all the way up to this um, black line. The agreement was that they would prospect all this, but they could only excavate three sites in any given season. As they were prospecting, I was not part of the project at that time. I only joined in 2019. So this was 2018. So as they were prospecting, they came across um, Ewas Oldupa, but which has previously been referred to as Geolocality 63. And they found this interesting stone tools on the surface, as well as bones eroding from the surface. And they decided that maybe they should um, excavate the site. They weren't too sure at the moment they saw this, but then when they realized the location of Geo 63, they decided that they had to excavate this site. And this is because Geo 63 is located about 300 meters from what is known as Geo 64, where Old Dubai Hominin number 65 was found. So Old Dubai Hominin number 65 is what is pictured. It is a mandible of a Homo habilis. So because of this correlation and of the artifacts they were finding on the surface, they thought it was Old Dubai would be a great site to explore. There have only been two field seasons so far. The pilot season was in 2018, where they did a test pit. And then we went back in 2019 to do a proper um, excavation based on what we found. What they found was very interesting. So in 2018, while they were doing a test, um, a test pit, as they were digging, they found this tuff here, okay? So further down below the tuff, they found artifacts as well as bones. So the geologists on site thought that this was what we call tuff 1B in Old Dubai Gorge. And tuff 1B dates to about 1.8 million years old. So then they thought that all the artifacts and bones that they were actually seeing below this tuff was older than 1.8 million. This was in 2018. So the geologists took samples and then they went back to Canada to study the, the and date the tuff just to be sure. And when they were dating, they were so surprised because this is actually not tuff 1B, but tuff 1A. Tuff 1A is 2 million years old. So meaning that the artifacts and the bones they were looking at were actually older than 2 million years old. So then in 2019, when we went back, they decided to dig trenches all along the stratigraphy to kind of see what was happening. So this is in, in red here, this is tough 1A. So this is the tough that was in the picture. And the test pits was done somewhere here. So all the stone tools at the time in 2018 and the corner came from this trench. So the, the project director decided that he wanted to see how far this stratigraphy was extending. And there is an igneum bright called Nabi igneum bright. It's from the Ngorongoro formation. So he decided to dig from that because it's known as being 2.06 million years old. So you kind of just see that stratigraphy all the way to tough 1B, which was 1.8 million years old, right? To kind of see the correlation. So we did, six trenches um, in different places. Trench two, three, and five were just underneath tough 1A. And then we did one trench, trench seven, right above the Nabi Ignium right? And this trench surprised us the most because that's where we found the stone tools. So then the stone tools they found were between 2.06 and 2 million years old, then making them the oldest stone tools. So then, because fauna from this site had never been studied, those and a, like an agency to study to see if there's a correlation between the fauna and the stone tools that we were finding, which is where I come in. So I looked at the fauna. Um, we had a total of about 4,000 specimens that we had from the field season. However, when we were um, 
publishing the paper, I had only looked at 1,042 specimens, which is what we sampled from trenches two and three. So trench five, seven, and six, I studied later on because it would be part of my PhD. I looked at all the fauna samples from the macrofauna, microfauna, the identified and non-identified species, and I had 506 that I could identify down to taxa, and 536 were non-identifiable for the paper, right? We looked at everything. I used a microscope to look at the modifications to kind of gather all the information I could from the fauna. Um, a total of 14 taxa were recorded, and as with most East African sites, and I think South African sites as well, the most dominant taxa were the bovids. Um, but we were surprised because we found other species as well, such as equids, suide, and we found primates, the Therapithecus oswaldi. And at first we were so excited in the field because we thought maybe hominin, but it was, it was just a primate, it was Therapithecus. Um, there are also other water, um, Reliance taxa that we found, such as crocodile, um, the turtles, and hippo. Um, with the microfauna, before I go to the taxa present, with the microfauna as well as the macrofauna, we were also surprised to find some taxa such as rhinos. We found rhinos, um, uh, the pelorovis, and also elephants. And then um, because Olduva is such an open air site and the um, natural modifications. The bones is very rounded. There's a lot of action going on. We did not expect to find as much microfauna, but we found a variety of species in microfauna from snakes to toads to hedgehogs, which was very um, surprising. So the site gave us a diversity in taxa. This is just a table showing you the three trenches that we sampled for the paper and the diversity in the taxa present. So from your bovids to your equids and also some carnivore presence and the water reliant um, features. We conducted stable isotope analysis, mainly from the molars of the bovids that we found to kind of see, kind of try and recreate the type of environment that was there and also like the plans just to do a multi-proxy study. And um, the findings were there is a variety of bovids present, both open uh, habitat bovids and closed habitat bovids. And this is just a representation of what the stable isotope analysis produced. Other than that, I did a skeletal parts profile based on what we call the normed NISP. So the normed NISP is based on NISP. NISP is the number of identifiable specimens. So for instance, if I find humerus, I find two humerus that belong to a bovid. If I am doing the normed NISP, I would divide that by the number of times that element appears in the body. So if it's humerus, then you divide it by two because you have two humeri. If it's radia, you do the same, just to kind of norm your, to calm down your, your assemblage. So we did that and we created a skeletal parts profile, which is important if you want to see the representation of elements and if, if there's any bias playing into your sample. This informs you of things such as transportation choices, utility choices, and we divided the, the assemblage into small, medium, and large. So small, in the paper was the size one and two, the medium was sizes three and four, and the large was sizes five and six. So if you look at the large column, there's kind of an over-representation of the skull, the skull fragments and the distal elements. The forelimb and hind limbs um, are not very much present in the, large, uh, in the large fauna, but this we can account for because my sample is also very fragmented. So maybe the fragmentary bits belong to the large fauna assemblage because in the last column, when we do a mixed representation of the sizes, small, medium, and large, you kind of see more or less equitable distribution of the, the elements. So there isn't much of a bias in relation to transports or utility use in the sample. Um, but with my, with my PhD um, studies, because I'm looking at more of the 
of the assemblage. This pattern is changing and I can tell you more about that next time. Um, we also did uh, MAU. So this is more or less the same as the normed NISP. We just did this to make sure that the results we were getting were actually telling us, um, um, were showing us the actual picture on the ground. So with the MAU, instead of using the normed NISP, you use your MNE according to Benford and Marianne. There have been a lot of... Um, um, <laughs> There've been a lot of, um, what do you call it? There've been a lot of ways established so that you can get your m &E. So, but it showed us more or less what we were seeing. As you can see, where the, the green represents the large mammal sizes and the blue, the medium. The same trend that we were seeing with the normed NISP, you see that because you see a higher representation of the skull fragments and then the distal fragments as well. But with the, the small and the medium, you kind of see more or less equal, especially with the small, the size one and two, more or less equal representation of all elements. And this might just have to do with the preservation because with small, um, with small fauna, it, because of the, um, the, very, the bones are very, comp there's less surface area to volume ratio. So when elements affect bigger, when natural elements or like human elements and other animals like hyenas and stuff, they would go to scavenge larger elements as opposed to smaller elements. So more or less in archeological sites, we always find the smaller elements of small, the, the elements of smaller size animals more intact as opposed to elements of larger mammals. And this is the pattern that we are seeing here in Olduvai, Ewas Olduvai. I created a tenary plot with the teeth that I had from the bovids and only bovids. So for at the time of the publication, we only had 50. So this tenary plot is created from 50, uh, 50 teeth. And more or less, they fall under the, um, the prime, um, prime category. So a lot of the animals that I'm looking at, they're prime, they're in their prime. And um, this was done using a 95% level of confidence. So if there are any anthropogenic um, um, signals present, then it would show that they're very um, capable because we are seeing more or less prime specimens rather than old or juvenile as usually um, seen in Pleistocene sites. These are some of the modifications that we had from one of the trenches. Um, unfortunately, during the time of the publication of the paper, we didn't find a lot of anthropogenic signals such as cut marks, but there were percussion marks with um, present that are associated to modification rather than carnivore chewing or gnawing. So the, the notch and the force size just uh, pointed towards anthropogenic modifications. However, we also have a lot of um, teeth marks from carnival and then um, a lot of natural modifications such as weathering, trampling, abrasion. And this might have a lot to do with the site itself rather than um, because where it's located, there's a lot of erosion and the formation is indicative of a lot of fluvial processes during being active during the time of accumulation. So they might have led to the modifications we are seeing, such as the, the rounding and the abrasion as well. Um, we looked at the bone breakage patterns. Here I looked at the flat bone fragments, which were the, the ribs, the vertebra, scapula, and pelvis fragments, and then the long bone fragments of the radius, humeri, tibia, and femur to see if there are any different breakage so, as noted, eroded um, fractures were the highest. A lot of the bones are very rounded, very smooth. We do have some transverse um, fractures and more in the long bone fragments. So fun fact, transverse fractures are usually associated with anthropogenic action because when you break, when you break the bone to access marrow, more or less, it usually um, results in a transverse fracture sometimes or spiral. And also if there's a lot of, um, if there's a high, um, high occupation, high occupation in a site, high levels of occupation in a site, we tend to see a lot more transverse fractures in the bones. 
than any other fractures. So having a high level of transverse and spiral fractures in the long bone, um, in the long bone fragments kind of supported our anthropogenic modifications hypothesis. We also found a few artifacts from the bones, like a lot of uh, pseudo bone tools with notches present. And um, this was interesting and it's still under study to just um, kind of represent it statistically and quantitatively in the best way. So more results will be in the way from that study. As Mpungi said earlier, and I said as well, the project is a multi-proxy project. So we wanted to see, because the taxa was pointing towards a mixed environment based on the, the, the taxa present, right? There's a diverse taxa. So it means like the environment is mixed. There's open, open grasslands. There's some bushlands as well as water bodies present. So they did a phyto phytolith analysis and plant wax biomarkers to kind of aid in the environmental recreation. And they found that there is a mixture of C3 and C4 dominates, plant dominates as well. So their results from the phytolith analysis supported our taxa, um, what our taxa was saying that it was a mixed environment, whereas Olduka would have been a mixed mosaic of environments. Conclusions from the paper and from the study as well. So the taxa, the phytolith analysis, they indicated that um, a was old power would have been a mixture of open landscapes with woodland, bushland, and water sources nearby. To a few because we did only find the percussion marks and also the presence of a lot of tooth marks from carnivores in the form of punctures, pits, and skulls show that there might have been a lot of competition with the carnivores as well, but anthropogenic modifications are still represented. As I studied further after the publication of the paper, I did find cut marks. There are a few cut marks. So this is good because then it would be the earliest association we can make between stone tools and fauna in old Vibodge. So that's also coming your way soon, I promise. Um, so what did all this tell us about um, Awas Oldupa in relation to, to hominins at the time? Um, number one, the earliest older one assemblage from Trent 7, because now we have the earliest stone tools between 2 million and 2.06, which is good because it shows hominin ingenuity, it pushes it even further. Two older one groups had the ability to exploit diverse environments. This is because the taxa, the phytolith analysis and all that showed us that there were an array of environments present. But with my finding of the tooth marks, sorry, the cut marks and the percussion marks on diverse taxa, it shows that the hominins had full, had the ability to exploit these different things because they're exploiting different taxa. Um, and this indicates uh, it points towards our third conclusion, which is the flexibility and adaptive behavior that we see, because we always talk about this flexibility and adaptability in the Middle Stone Age. So, and I don't think it just started in the Middle Stone Age. It might have started earlier and just made um, advanced in as we get to the Middle Stone Age and the Holocene. So then we do see that flexibility and adaptive behavior from the ability to exploit different taxa, the stone tools present at an earlier age. So um, yeah, that's what it told us about the hominins. Um, I don't know if I have time, but I will run because this is a PhD, we good on time, okay. So this, this project now is part of my PhD. So I do aim to look at um, fauna from bed one and two. It was all Dupa only presents bed. So the 4,000 specimens I have are only from bed one. I need to get samples from bed two, three, and four so that I can do a full comprehensive study of beds one and four in the Western Gorge, and then compare that to the studies that have been done in the main gorge, as well as the Eastern Gorge. Um, the very well-known sites such as FLK Zinch, which I think has had the most comprehensive study done. And it would be interesting if we can do the same with EWAS and see if we are kind of getting the same signals all throughout the basin. Um, so why, <laughs> what are my aims to, <laughs> for doing this PhD? Um, I wish to understand the relationship between the fauna sets, 
the hominins and the environments, what is happening, what, who is hunting who, what are they eating, and what kind of environments are these fauna um, pointing us to. So I decided to not only look at the big fauna, I'm also looking at the microfauna, which I'm currently working on. And because microfauna are a great indicator of the paleo environment. So in this way, I can have a fully comprehensive fauna study. Um, I also would like to infer hominin resource access type. In the Pleistocene sites, there have been a lot of um, arguments that the hominins were either aggressive scavengers or just scavengers accessing the, the resources after carnivores hunted. But if I can study more fauna and see more anthropogenic modifications without the carnival action present, then we can actually say, oh, maybe it's hominin first, or maybe it is carnival first, or is there like uh, also another um, agent present, like maybe vultures or raptors at work. Um, determine the different type of hominin occupation sites. So again, this has also been um, an argument, a long lasting argument in place to sites, whether they use certain places as kill sites, as the living sites, living floors, what is happening. So maybe as we increase the faunal size and we look at the different beds, we can kind of contribute towards the ongoing debate of what's happening with this living um, or hunting or whatever situation. Um, evaluate the formation of the funnel assemblage and industry. So just look at maybe what caused, what are the agents of accumulation? How did these places form the assemblage that we're looking at? Is it a natural accumulation? Is it accumulated by both um, hominins and kind of was just paint a full picture. And like I said earlier, I'm going to be looking at um, fauna from beds one, two, three, and four. So this COVID permitting, um, I hope to go back to the field next year to get um, more samples from Geolocality 65. And there's another site called Embornado, which would have bed two. And then we have beds three and four from Engajina Nyori and Camp Corongo, respectively. So if all goes well, then I should be able to have more data <laughs> to do this comprehensive study. Um, yeah, we talked about this. So <laughs> this is a PhD by, <laughs> by publication. So I do hope to publish three papers. Currently, I am working on my first and second paper simultaneously. A lot of things have changed as with any PhD. Initially, my second publication was meant to be on. In Plato's Insights, we see a lot of disparity in the fauna accumulation and the lithic accumulation. Like we never see a direct correlation where we find a lot of cut marks and then we find the stone tools and we can say, this is what was happening. So I was hoping to do actualistic studies to kind of see if I can recreate the conditions. However, we find a lot, we found a lot of interesting microfauna. So now my second paper is gonna be about the microfauna from Old Dubai. And I'm working on that as well as working on the first paper, which is finishing um, the taphonomic and taxonomic analyses of the 4,000 specimens and publishing that to say, what are they saying about the old vi hominins? And then the third publication would be from the beds two, three, and four fauna, which hopefully if we go to the field next year, I can publish um, about that. If not, who knows, we might change, we might find something else, but for now, that's the plan. <laughs> um, so that's that. Thank you. Um, I just have a few pictures of some of the interesting found, finds that we found in 2019. This was my favorite so far. This is an elephant found, and as you can see, it is one human long. So there's a lot of interesting things. <laughs> <laughs> and now if you have any questions feel free to to go to go ahead thank you you are taking my job away pam <laughs> <laughs> right so thank you so much for your presentation it was really really informative um at least now we know that there's a lot of exciting stuff at all the gorge we knew it was a famous site but this is very interesting mm -hmm. and the fact that you have a whole team working on this with the phytolists the lithics the fauna the microfauna, appreciate that one. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a very, 
you've got a whole jam-packed PhD and I hope everything goes well with you. Okay, you. so let me just start with the question and answer session. Is there anybody who has a question to ask Pamela? I do. Okay, continue, Kalita. Thank you so much. Pam, thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. It is, honestly, your work's always been exceptional and it continues to be. And congratulations on your already published work and yeah. the three publications you're definitely going to get. Um, I did want to ask you initially um, some questions associated with environmental context and the implications of your study on Olduvai hominin uh, behavior, but you covered that really, really well. So instead, what I want to ask is, um, all divides obviously been studied for a very, very long time. And as you said, your multi-proxy or multidisciplinary approach to analysis has really resulted in incredible um, outcomes. Is there at the moment any sites for comparative purposes that you think are very similar to the results you've found or should be re-evaluated either in East Africa or even South Africa, I dare say, which has very poor preservation, but I'm just asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Um, thanks, Kalita. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that if because there have been a lot of studies, especially in old Dubai. So I am not sure currently if my results would point towards a re-evaluation, because for, for instance, like DK, David Skoromo is a bed two site, if I'm not wrong, right? And I was hoping to have Fauna from bed two to compare to that because for like bed one, it would be what FLK Zinge. And that's what I would want to compare with a was all the pie. Though FLK Zinge has like a lot of um, studies done on it and it has a really good correlation between the fauna and the stone tool. So right now I can't really be like, there needs to be a re-evaluation. With regards to South Africa, I was thinking of looking at my results and looking at um, sites such as Stark Fontaine and see what's, what the implications are. So that's a very good question. And maybe when I am done looking at this data, we can say for sure whether it's the same pattern or whether we need to re-evaluate either my site or the other sites. Awesome. Thank you so much. That would be, I think, a really exciting future project. We should do it together. Okay. If you okay. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, <laughs> the next person with a question because I'm fangirling now. So, <laughs> um, if I can just, oh, Mariette, oh, you can sorry. go for it. Um, so, thank you. Wonderful presentation. And a lot of such a wide variety of different animal species. Um, yeah. Are there any, any taxa that you found like the most you didn't expect to find them? Do you have like a top hit list for like random animals you really didn't expect to pop up? <laughs> yes. Um, so, and I was talking to Mpumi about this because she knows a lot about microfauna. So when I initially found the microfauna, I was looking at the vertebrae and everything. And I was just like, maybe they're rodents, maybe they're shrews. And then I talked to a microfauna specialist at Ipes and they're not, they're snakes and frogs and toads and I didn't expect that and because he was looking at the vertebrae he's like oh you have different sized snakes in your collection so that was the biggest one for me in terms of microfauna and with the macrofauna I found a rhinoceros too and that was really cool so those that's my hit list it's the snakes the frogs and the rhino <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, microfauna has been very unrecognized mm. in in yeah. study, yeah. and I'm guessing we will raise our hands on that one as well. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm someone else I'm who's ready. also big into microfauna, <laughs> so I can. Just, yeah, so, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mariette, for your question. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, Shireen. Um, thank you, Pamela. Um, it was a really interesting presentation and I really enjoyed it. Um, I just have a quick question with regards to the taphonomy you found um, on the bones um, or your sample. Um, so I'm assuming most of the taphonomic um, features, um, the breaks and the frag uh, fractures, were intentional um, 
breaking of the bones to get to the marrow. Um, do you have, or did you find possibly any um, examples of fire, um, maybe using natural fires? Um, yeah, that's my question. Let me tell you, I would have started with fire if I had found it because I'm such a big fan of fire. But unfortunately for now, we haven't found any intentional burning. And the thing with, so my sample, a lot of, and I wish I would have shown you like images, but maybe next time. Um, a lot of the specimens are very gray in color, very heavily fossilized. So a lot of them are gray in color. So when I first saw them, I was like, oh my God, fire. But no, it's just staining. So unfortunately for now, no fire has been found. So sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. And if I just may conclude with my own question, but I love the, the information about fire. It would have been exciting to find fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we can conclude with my, my question. Um, my question to you is, what are your future directions with after you've uh, published your research and completed and acquired your PhD? Wow, that's a grand question. Um, <laughs> Save it for last. <laughs> Save it for last. Thank you. Um, honestly, I would like to help in creating a database for all the Vygoch of all the taxa in terms of fauna that have been found. There's a really nice one for Kubi fauna. And I think if we have the same for all Dubai, we can kind of compare and get a better idea. And in this way, Anyone can have access to it. it, would be an open database. It doesn't have to be um, just like for specialists. I want it to be open for any scholars, like and especially African scholars who want to study African sites. Even if like you're in South Africa and you're looking at Pleistocene sites and you're like, oh, I want to compare it with what's in East Africa, then you would have the databases present for that. So that would be one of the things I'd like to do. And maybe some actualistic studies. Um, there's a lot coming up on crocodiles, like with regards to tooth marks and how they kind of give fake signals, uh, like pseudo cut marks. So that would also be an interesting thing to do, if I can. Well, thank you, Pamela. I feel like you've already sold everyone. You're just going to yeah. have a whole army yeah. of archaeologists coming to, this, to, this to this, Tanzania this. to help. <laughs> 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 but yeah i'd like to thank you for coming being our guest speaker we appreciate you and your your research and how it's going to help everybody else and also the public as well this will be very some like something very interesting for them to to find out about and thank you so much and i'm sure we're good on time so thank you pamela thank you Thank you guys for having me. It was so much fun. I appreciate it. And you guys were such an amazing audience. Thank you for mm. the questions and invite me again, please. Definitely. Definitely. Oh, and we'll <laughs> add your, your, your information so people can follow you or contact you if they want any to find out more about your, your research and if they need help. Okay, perfect. Right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, everyone. I think this was a fantastic session. And to the students out there who has just finished listening to this presentation, remember to complete the activity that is connected to this lecture to ensure that you are showing your participation in the Student Development Conference. All right, so don't forget to tune in. We've got a lot of exciting content still uh, available for you guys to watch at your leisure. And then thank you once again for everyone today for your time. And yes, we'll definitely keep you on hand for future presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and that concludes Thanks. our session for today. Thanks, everyone. Keep well. Bye.